Hello, hello. Welcome back to the R6RS report training arc where we train ourselves to become better at Scheme, the greatest programming language ever created. This is my first video that I'm uploaded in a week, I think. I am quite behind in my kilo tube challenge. I almost gave up. I even recorded a video saying that I gave up, but then I remembered the immortal words from Galaxy Quest, never give up, never surrender. So I'm going to keep keep on keeping on. Uh, this is the fourth time I think I've recorded this particular video. I've had trouble each time. I actually was on a roll a minute ago and then I fat fingered it and accidentally opened up my contacts and you could see everyone's phone numbers. And I said, okay, that's a re, <laughs> that's a redo. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay, so here we go. We're going to talk about assignment. And we have about 29 minutes because I've got a call coming up. So we're just going to try to get through this. We're going to power through it. Okay, here we go. Let's fire up Shay. Oh, I'm starting to get better at Dvorak. Starting to be able to use Emacs with Dvorak and I've got the Apple trackpad thingy between the two halves of the Kinesis. So starting to become a little less noob, but that didn't stop me from accidentally opening my contacts. Bottom of page seven, 1.8 assignment. Scheme variables bound by definitions or let or lambda expressions are not actually bound directly to the objects specified in the respective bindings, but to collocations, locations containing these objects. The contents of these locations can subsequently be modified destructively via assignment. Assignment is italicized, that means a new technical term. Here's an example in the form of a let expression. Let's go ahead and type it in, make sure it works. Whoops. Dvorak strikes again. That's okay, I'm getting better at recovering. At this point, I think I have the example memorized. It's not that complicated. All right, we have a let expression. Let x be 23, set bang x to 42, x. Let's see what that evaluates to, 42, great. Let's see what the description of that expression's behavior is. We're on top of page eight now. In this case, the body of the let expression consists of two expressions which are evaluated sequentially. So we're evaluating in order, top to bottom, with the value of the final expression becoming the value of the entire let expression. The expression set bang x to 42 is an assignment saying, replace the object in the location referenced by x with 42. Thus the previous value of x, 23, is replaced by 42. Okay, so this is an important idea. When we have a let or a lambda or a define, if we define, let's, let's do a top level define for example. Okay, so we have this defined, and we have a definition. 
All right, and we have foo. It is easy for us to think that foo, the variable foo, has the value seven, okay? That those two are the same, that wherever we see a foo, we can just write a seven. If we see a seven, we could replace it with foo, and they really mean the same thing. That would be true if we didn't have any notion of assignment or destructive update or mutation, but we do in Scheme. And so I could set bang foo to be a different value. Let's try it. Okay, now let's look at foo. Okay, foo now has the value 20. So the thing to remember is that when we define foo, we're saying that foo has the value seven initially. However, what foo is really referring to isn't seven, it's referring to a location in memory that initially has the value seven. And we can change the value in memory using assignment. Okay. Right. Important to understand that. So Scheme is not a functional programming language. Scheme is a multi-paradigm language. You're allowed to do assignment, mutation, various types of side effects. Okay, It is not a purely functional language. You can program in a purely functional style if you want, and I usually do, uh, but it is a multi-paradigm language. It supports more than one paradigm. All right, that's assignment. All right, I think we have time to dive into 1.9, derived forms and macros. Mmm. Okay, macros. Now we're getting into the heart of which of what makes Lisp Lisp, in my opinion, what makes Scheme Scheme is the ability to define syntactic abstractions. Many of the special forms specified in this report can be translated into more basic special forms. For example, a LUT expression can be translated into a procedure call and a Lambda expression. The following two expressions are equivalent. Let X be 23, y be 42 in the body plus xy. That alert expression, which evaluates the 65, is equivalent to left, left, lambda. That's how Dan Friedman would say it. With the formals of x and y and the body of the lambda of plus xy applied to two arguments, 23 and 42. So we have a direct application, a direct procedural app procedure application of the procedure we get back from a lambda expression with a few arguments. Okay, and that also evaluates the 65. And in scheme, they are equivalent. Okay, that doesn't mean that the let expression turns into the left left lambda or the direct application. And it doesn't mean that the direct application turns into the let, but they are equivalent. And different implementations will handle that equivalence differently. But the point is, theoretically, they mean exactly the same thing. Their behavior is indistinguishable. So um, let's just try, let's just try these out real quick in Shea. Okay, and I'm gonna see if I can make Emacs uh, a little less wide so I can see this to type it in. All right, here we go.
And yes, I'm typing this on Dvorak. Yeah. All right. Evaluate it. 65. Great. Let's try again. There we go, 65 again. All right, so the claim is, according to the report, that these two expressions are equivalent. Now, we can use expand to see if they are equivalent and, or which way they're equivalent. So let's try expanding uh, these expressions. We're going to quote the expression. All right, let's expand the let first. Okay, now we have all of these generated symbols they're introduced to preserve hygiene, which we'll talk about later. And we can also see that, um, you know, the addition uh, got transformed into this built-in. Um, that's so that the variable reference, you know, doesn't have to happen in the same way. And you know that this is actually the built-in plus, not some user-defined plus. Um, but in any case, you know, we can see that the let expanded to another let. You can see it right here. There's a let. And the names look uh, different, but the structure is the same. The structure is the same. We could turn off the gen sims. We could do a call to print hyphen gen sim hash f if we don't want to see the gen sims. Yeah, let's try it. It's me being lazy, so I don't have to type on Dvorak, but let's not be lazy. Okay, let's try expanding again. All right, so it's the same except we're we're uh, not seeing the gen sim names. We're seeing x and y. If you look at the gen sims, by the way, these generated symbols, you can see the original variable names there, x and y. It's just that you can also see that there's this generated symbol that's supposedly unique. All right. So that's what it looks like. We uh, let expands to a let uh, with this gen simming and renaming of plus. Let's turn off the print gen sim for a moment. Or turn it back on, I should say. Okay, great. Now let's expand the other variant, the left, left, lambda, the direct application, procedure application. Oops. Okay, all right, where's my left, left, lambda? Here it is. Let's expand that. What do you think that will expand to? Oh, look at it. Expanded to let. Wow. Now, in many implementations of Scheme, it would go the other way around. You'd have a let expand to a direct application of Lambda. Or at least that's one way you can implement it. 
The w reason Shea does it the other way is that to evaluate a let expression, you don't have to create a closure. And you don't have to do a procedure application. So it can be more efficient to do the let. So since Shea is all about efficiency, turning the left left lambda into a let makes sense. Now, Shea still has to implement procedure application and still has to have lambda uh, that evaluates the procedure. But in this case, it actually goes the other way than I had been uh, expecting, especially since when you learn how to write macros, you're often taught how to write the let macro to expand to uh, a lambda and application. So I thought, oh yeah, of course, that's the way you'd implement it. But in an optimizing compiler like Shea, you know, might be a little more sophisticated. The The important part is that they're equivalent. So you could go either way, doesn't matter. Or you could just leave them the same and have the implementation deal with let as one case and application and lambda as the other. They, they don't have to expand into each other. They just have to be equivalent in terms of behavior, okay? All right, very nice. Special forms like let expressions are called derived forms because their semantics can be derived from that of other kinds of forms by a syntactic transformation. Some procedure definitions are also derived forms. The following two definitions are equivalent. Okay, so here's what we what I would call the MIT syntax. Define left paren fx right paren with the body plus x 42. So here we're defining a function called f that takes one argument x and then x uh, adds 42 to x. Or we could use what I'll call the Indiana or Dan Friedman style um, where you always make the lambda explicit and the define, uh, <clears throat> you know, you, you want to make the lambda stick out. Uh, that's sort of Dan's philosophy for showing, you know, he doesn't want to hide the lambda and he doesn't want define to look like magic, okay? Um, so here we say define f, be lambda x plus x 42. These two expressions are equivalent, once again, okay? And if you don't, if you don't believe me, you could try in your implementation um, and see what happens. Now, in the, okay, given um, the time we have available, let, let me just see if I can copy this over. Let's just try for a minute. Let's try an experiment or two, see what these expand to at least. Here's the MIT style. Okay. Here's F as a procedure. Oops. Struck by Dvorak again. Oh, go back. There we go. So F is indeed a procedure of one argument. That adds a 42 to this argument. No problem. Let's try expanding that define, see what we get. This, by the way, to me, is how you really get to learn a language and implementation. It's playing all these little games. That's the value part, a valuable part of, of what we're doing here. And hopefully to instill that spirit in you, if, if you don't already have this kind of in your head of, of playing around these little games. You know, it's fine to read something in, in the report or in a paper or whatever, but you really wanna try it out and play around with it. Make sure you understand it. Okay, for this define, which is a top level define, that turns into a begin of a set bang. Okay, so we're doing global set bang or assignment. And so in Shea at the top level, if you set bang F to some value, that is creating a binding for F. 
You remember f will be bound to a location that contains a value. So we're saying, hey, we want new location f that whose initial value will be the value of this lambda expression, that is procedure. You can see that there's hygienic renaming happening on the on the x, and also of course the plus is being um, expanded to the built-in plus. And at the be at the end of the begin, we have this call to void. And I assume that's because we don't want to produ uh, produce a useful value. Um, setBang itself doesn't produce a useful value. So in theory, you might be able to simplify this to just the setBang. I'm not sure. I don't know if that's uh, correct or not. Um, but in any case, that's what it expands to. I'm a little surprised in some sense, I guess. Uh, I, yeah. The, the part that I'm a little surprised by, I guess, well, the first time I saw this, had to do with the context in which you can put a define. So a define, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Um, a define, when you use define, that is a definition. That is not an expression, that's a definition. We've talked about this before. So, So if I put the define in the list, so that, that definition of list, okay. When I try evaluating that call to list, I get an exception, invalid context for definition. Okay, so the arguments to list are, have to be expressions. Define can't be used in expression context, into, in a context that only expects expressions. Uh, so it's just not, you know, that's just not allowed syntactically. Now we, we can try expanding that call list. Let's try expanding it. I think that's interesting. So we get exception in valid context for definition. So to me, this is interesting because I think what this is saying is that it's actually the macro expansion process that is um, giving us the, uh, you know, the invalid context exception. So in other words, it's not like the macros all expand and then the compiler on core scheme runs and then gives us an exception. Rather, the macro expander refuses to expand this expression. Okay, well, in any case, let's just go back to what our original expression, uh, expansion was with the, with the, uh, the begin and the set bang. So here's our expand uh, for the original define. Let's take a look at it, great. Now let's do another expand And let's do the other supposedly equivalent, what I call the IU version of the syntax. Let's try expand that. See if they are equivalent. Okay, expand away. Sure enough, they look identical to me. Now, if you look closely, you'll notice, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, you'll notice these gen sims are different. The only way they're different, by the way, is that one has a hyphen seven and one has a hyphen eight. So the way Shay does this gen simming is that once it's got this sort of prefix thing, it's just going to increment a counter. Um, so this prefix is supposedly unique upon um, between invocations of Shea and even running Shea on different machines with supposedly similar hardware setups because I think it uses things like the Mac address or whatever. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how the current Shea 
uh, generates this. But if you started up Shea again and ran the same program, you might get the um, hyphen eight if you did things in the same order, but this prefix should be different, at least in theory. Uh, or at least there should be vanishingly small probability that you would get that same prefix for the gensim. Anyway, uh, other than the actual gensim value, uh, these look the same. And, and even the gensims, you notice the pattern of the gensim use is the same. So we have a seven here and a seven here. Okay, so, um, and if we uh, turned off the printing of the gensims, those expressions should look identical. So sure enough, those two uh, versions of definition syntax are equivalent in Shea. In Scheme, it is possible for a program to create its own derived forms by binding syntactic keywords to macros. Hmm. We'll definitely get into this. <clears throat> Define syntax def, syntax rules, and then empty list. And then we have what's called, okay, so, so here we have syntax rules. We'll also look at syntax case later. Uh, this is the auxiliary keywords list, or sometimes called the exact match list for helper syntax, like in cond, the arrow, or the else in cond, for example. And then we have one clause where we have a, um, uh, a pattern that syntax rules will pattern match against. And then we have what's called a template, which is what that pattern will expand to. And uh, we have these dot, dot, dots, which mean zero more occurrence of whatever pattern comes before the dot, dot, dots immediately before. Uh, and then this is doing pattern matching. So, and then the name of the, the macro is def. So we can see we have a def here. If you look at actual macro uses, usually there's an underscore there um, to remind you that, you know, it's like, well, that's just the name of the macro. And in fact, this name is completely ignored. You could put anything there and it would still work. At least that, that was the case for R5. Um, but by convention, people put an underscore. That's just the macro name. All right, so that is a little macro that um, is a type of syntactic shorthand for doing a the uh, MIT style of uh, definition. Um, well, expands to the MIT style of uh, procedure definition. And this is sort of a shorthand, um, is closer to the Dan Friedman IU style. However, it leaves out the lambda, which <laughs> sort of defeats the purpose from the Dan standpoint, I guess. Um, but, you know, we shorten the name to def. If you really hate typing that INE and you want a slightly different syntax um, and you don't want to type the lambda, well, then you can write this sort of thing and pretend you're in Python with parens or something. I don't know. Um, so anyway, that's a little little example. We can try it out quickly. Uh, and try it out oh so quickly, oh so quickly, and then I get a call. Try it out. Copy that. Got the definition. Let's try the use. Okay. Now, of course, we already have an F that adds uh, a value, but this should be a new F. That seems to work. Um, yeah, so we can define new syntax. This is about the most boring macro you can imagine, which is a good example. And the time is up. We will continue on from here. Let's just read this last uh, thing. The defined syntax construct specifies that a, parenth a parenthesized structure matching the pattern, def f p dot dot dot, terrible line break body, where FP and body are pattern variables that match the 
the actual um, concrete syntax in your call, like this, uh, where uh, yeah, our pattern variables is translated to this definition. Okay, thus the def form appearing in the example gets translated to define f x plus x forty two. The ability to create new syntactic keywords makes Scheme extremely flexible and expressive. That's true. Allowing many of the features built into other languages to be derived forms in Scheme. All right, it really is time for me to go. Um, yeah, and that is true as well. And let's just try, uh, let's just try one thing here. Let's just see what happens. if I do an expand. There you go. This is all our old friend. This is what happens when you have that defined. Okay. Notice it didn't expand just to the define call. It expanded all the way down to the core scheme that Shea Scheme handles. All right, great, we got through assignments and uh, learning a little bit about syntactic um, abstraction. All right, and now we're, uh, we finished the first column of page eight. Talk to you soon, bye-bye.